Sin más, vamos a dar paso a, a Nicola Trebovic, director ejecutivo en Pfizer y partner en Pfizer Ventures. Eh, queremos deciros que Nicola podrá responder algunas, algunas preguntas de, los, eh, de, los, eh, de vosotros, de los asistentes, al finalizar su presentación en unos minutos. Así que, por favor, hacednosla llegar eh, a través de la herramienta Slido. Eh, Nicola, eh, eh, Nicola Tribovich from Pfizer and Pfizer Ventures takes part in now and he will be able to answer questions at the end of his presentation. So please feel free to ask him through the Slido platform. Uh, Nicola, thank you very much for joining us today. We are very grateful to you for that and for your time. Um, and now um, I think that you can, you can share your presentation and you can start your, your speech once ready. Thanks. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to present. Let me see if I can pull up my slides here. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks again for inviting me to speak. Um, so I've been asked to, to give an overview of Pfizer Ventures. Pfizer Ventures is uh, Pfizer's corporate venture capital group, uh, which means we make equity investments like other venture capital investors would in entities, mostly companies, that could be of future strategic interest to Pfizer and that are positioned for both portfolio impact and financial returns. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we act much like a financial investor in that we uh, look to uh, generate financial returns from our investments, but we exclusively invest in companies that are working on healthcare innovation uh, that could be of interest to Pfizer down the line once it matures, such that Pfizer might want to acquire the company, the product, uh, or, or use the technology. So as I mentioned, we invest in innovative breakthrough science in, in Pfizer's core therapeutic areas plus neuroscience. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, we acquire uh, minority stakes in private companies, so before they would uh, go public in the public markets. Uh, we almost always co-invest with other venture capital groups, be they uh, institutional investors or, for as a matter of fact, other corporate venture groups. Uh, we participate on the board of the company. That is how we manage and support the companies beyond just uh, our investment. And we look for companies that have the potential for future uh, business development transactions with Pfizer, but we don't require that in any way at the time of investment. Uh, we invest across all stages of uh, company and development from idea, concept, all the way to the clinical stage. And the vast majority of what we do is therapeutic innovation, investment in companies that are discovering and developing novel medicines, because that is, after all, the, the core business of Pfizer. But we reserve a, a, a portion of our funds, uh, about 20%, for non-therapeutics companies. So companies that are working on technologies that either um, uh, could be useful in the development of therapeutics uh, or, or elsewhere in the healthcare ecosystem. So how do we do this? Uh, we partner closely, apologies for the acronyms here, with, with the rest of Pfizer on diligence. We, we use the fact that Pfizer has uh, close to 10,000 colleagues in R&D and, and many more colleagues elsewhere in, in the clinical organization, the business units that are subject matter experts in the, in the therapeutic areas and indications that Pfizer is active in. And we leverage their expertise when we uh, evaluate an investment. Um, we are an active investor. We've worked with management um, to develop the strategy and build value. Um, we always participate in following investments of our companies through to the IPO. Uh, and I, I alluded to the fact that we try to contribute more to our companies than just capital. So members of our team serve on the boards of the companies and try to direct them uh, towards a successful uh, future, either standalone or in partnership with, with another company like Pfizer. Uh, but we also look for opportunities to offer Pfizer expertise beyond our own, uh, be it in manufacturing, in market access, in chemistry, in CMC regulatory, uh, where that's appropriate. Um, and usually that comes for free. Um, 
uh, again, in the future, we look for, for business development opportunities with Pfizer. Um, and, and, and we look to provide financial returns to the corporation and essentially cover our costs so that this, this is a, 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 an activity that, that doesn't cost Pfizer anything, ideally uh, generates returns. Uh, but, but builds a portfolio of, of, of good, strong companies that Pfizer has invested in, all of whom are working on uh, innovation that's relevant to Pfizer's business and, and pipeline. So uh, more, most recently in, in 2018, Pfizer committed a, a new chunk of capital, 600 million of capital for us to work with. So, so you can think of us like a, like a, a standard size venture capital group in, in the US, I would say. Just a little bit about the team. We've assembled a, a, a relatively small but a strong team of folks that bring a, a breadth of, of experience uh, spanning you know, R&D, both biology, chemistry, uh, clinical, uh, venture capital experience, obviously very important based on what we do, as well as some, some commercial and market access experience. Uh, just a little bit about myself there in the in the bottom right. Uh, I'm a I'm a biochemist, structural biologist by training. Uh, I went to undergraduate uh, school in Germany, uh, finished my graduate school and postgraduate work in 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 the U.S. Uh, and then actually went into management consulting. I was with McKinsey and Company for for a number of years, working on a range of topics in in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, actually, the minority of my work was R&D. Uh, a lot of it was well, across the value chain from manufacturing through to regulatory market access marketing. Really got a good uh, feel for all the things that go into actually bringing a medicine to patients. Uh, but ultimately, uh, as a trained scientist, wanted to get back closer to the science without being uh, at the bench myself and have been doing venture investing now at Pfizer for most of my time here. Uh, so, you know, this, this uh, event is about innovation. So, so let me talk a little bit about uh, how we think about innovation and how to prioritize investments. So as I mentioned, as, as a strategic investor, we are focused on areas that uh, are st strategic to Pfizer. And, and those are shown here currently. There are five therapeutic areas that Pfizer is actively engaged in R&D in, rare disease oncology, inflammation immunology, internal medicine, and vaccines. And then there's neuroscience. Uh, some of you may have followed uh, the news over the past few years. At the beginning of 2018, um, uh, Pfizer announced that it's discontinuing uh, internal uh, research, early stage research in neuroscience. But at the same time, Pfizer increased its, its commitment to uh, venture investment in the neuroscience space. And that is through Pfizer Ventures. So the capital that was uh, allocated to us at the beginning of 2018, uh, up to 25% of that is earmarked for neuroscience. And the logic there was while the corporation decided that uh, Pfizer's R&D organization is not the best place to draw, continue to drive innovation in neuroscience, uh, there is no doubt that, is, that it is still one of the, the greatest areas of medical unmet need out there and that uh, Pfizer's capital and, and some of the more generalizable drug discovery and development expertise uh, could be helpful in driving that innovation forward, which is why uh, that is still an area of interest for us to invest in. Um, spanning uh, these uh, therapeutic areas, there is also a number of areas that we have defined as uh, core areas of biology that, that touch multiple diseases, multiple therapeutic areas, and as such are interesting to us from an investment perspective. One such area are, uh, are repeat expansions where there are both genetic disorders uh, uh, that are rare, um, but, but also the recognition that the uh, genes and, and proteins involved in those disorders are often DNA damage response proteins which is an important uh, area of, of research and innovation and, and frankly, sensitivity uh, in, in cancer cells. So those are the, those first two uh, buckets there. Uh, another area that was identified is uh, tissue resident immunity, uh, which really spans uh, almost all uh, of Pfizer's strategic therapeutic areas, except for vaccines, perhaps. Uh, probably should extend into neuroscience as well. Uh, where, where we have been looking for new investments. 
And then ultimately senescence, certainly not a new area of biology, but one that has recently uh, been revived with, with I think, uh, novel discoveries, not just in cancer, but, but also around fibrosis and, and other areas. So here are just some of the examples of companies that we've recently invested in um, to give you a, a more tangible feel. And there's another slide uh, with, with recent investment examples of, of what, what are the types of companies we invest in. Triplet Therapeutics is a uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts-based company that is uh, working on a uh, antisense uh, therapeutic against uh, one such DNA damage response target that is, is implicated quite strongly with human genetics and other evidence in driving, in fact, the progression of, of repeat expansion disorders like Huntington's or, or myotonic dystrophy. Uh, uh, on the uh, other side of the DNA damage response coin in oncology, we have two investments, uh, both European investments. In fact, Arteos is based in, in the UK and, and Forks Therapeutics is based in Switzerland, uh, both of whom are going after novel uh, DNA damage response targets. So novel uh, DNA uh, damage uh, response proteins that that have been identified as, as potential vulnerabilities in, in certain cancers uh, where where targeting them could could specifically uh, damage the cancer cells but not healthy cells and then one example on tissue resident immunity uh, t-rex bio uh, is a company that that actually started in the uk but has since moved to the west coast of the us um, uh, that uh, is focusing on uh, identifying and, and, and modulating uh, tissue resident T regulatory cells as a way of more specifically uh, uh, treating both, both cancer from an immuno-oncology perspective, uh, as well as uh, it, it, diseases of, of, of inflammation and immunology. Um, so um, before I move on to the next slide, actually, let me let me speak to to a couple of things that you don't see here. Uh, one area that you don't see here, because this is a very biology and therapeutic area focused slide, is uh, novel modalities. Certainly, uh, we recognize the tremendous amount of innovation that's happening on the therapeutic side in gene therapy and other related areas, and it's also some of you may know an area that Pfizer at large, the corporation has invested in quite heavily. Uh, we have also made investments in that space and it's an area that, that, that we are following quite, quite closely, be it AAV gene therapy, other gene therapy approaches, gene editing or the like. Um, another topic you don't see here uh, that is uh, probably the biggest priority right now for Pfizer as a corporation is uh, the global coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I think I can, uh, I don't need to speak to to this audience about the efforts that Pfizer is 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 undertaking with respect to the pandemic. Uh, first and foremost, with our vaccine, uh, but also with other approaches like antivirals. Um, this is something that that is really a corporate priority that that members of our team uh, support, but it's not necessarily part of our, our our overall investment strategy. Just a couple more examples here on recent investments. I've spoken on the left-hand side in oncology about RTOs and forks in the DNA damage response space. Uh, quite recent, one of our most recent investments is in bulk therapeutics. This is a more mature company that is clinical stage uh, that is uh, advancing what they call immune stimulating antibody conjugates. So these work similar to antibody drug conjugates, but instead of uh, having a, a cytotoxic payload, uh, so an antibody that basically brings uh, a poison to a, to a cancer cell, uh, they carry a payload that's designed to stimulate the immune system and provoke the immune system in a more targeted fashion to attack the cells, the cancer cells recognized by the, the, the antibody. Uh, and these uh, conjugates are designed to activate the innate immune sp system specifically, which is one uh, big area of interest for, for Pfizer and also Pfizer Ventures is sort of how do you expand the tremendous innovation that's happened in immuno-oncology from the adaptive immune system uh, to the innate immune system and bring the innate immune system into the fight against cancer, uh, which by the way, could also uh, help overcome some of the resistance that, that the cancer develops to, to the adaptive immunity side of things. Um, both Immunos and Montes fall into that broader bucket of, of innate immunity, uh, uh, mobilizing innate immunity against cancer. 
uh, and to some degree also Imchek Therapeutics, a French company that's focusing on, on activating gamma delta T cells. Uh, finally, on this list, uh, Chimera Therapeutics, another example of a, an exciting novel modality. Uh, it's not, maybe not as shiny, as fancy as uh, gene therapy, but uh, some of you may have followed the innovation that has happened around protein degraders, which are really uh, synthetic molecules, some might call them small molecules, although they're not as small as, as the typical drug that, that, that one would take in a pill, uh, that, that work quite differently from traditional small molecule drugs in that they don't necessarily inhibit an enzyme, but rather uh, uh, lead to the degradation of the protein and, and there, thereby open up the, the, the lens for what kinds of targets can be targeted with, with synthetic molecules. On the right-hand side, spoke about inflammation, you know, about T-Rex bio in the inflammation immunology bucket. Uh, in neuroscience, just one example, one recent example of an investment we've made in a, in a, in a uh, company called Mitokinin that is going after a, a novel target uh, for Parkinson's disease with small molecules. And then also uh, bleeding into the rare disease side, Autobahn is, is also quite a recent investment we've made in, in uh, thyroid hormone agonists uh, designed for neurological applications, both rare and, and more common like, like multiple sclerosis. And finally, triplet, triplet I've spoken about as well. So I believe this could be my last slide. This just exemplifies how we deliver both that pipeline and financial impact that, that I mentioned up front on the pipeline front or strategic front uh, we have a number of recent examples, this is all from last year, that we can point to. Uh, Theracon uh, was, again, a Swiss company, uh, first uh, company that Pfizer Ventures had invested in that uh, got acquired by Pfizer. Um, they had a, a phase two asset for, for the rare disease achondroplasia, uh, and that is now a, an asset that is actively advancing in the Pfizer portfolio. Uh, a couple of other companies there where we've exercised options uh, or, or licenses and Tolerex is in the, in the space of antigen specific tolerance for autoimmune disease. Effector is going after novel targets in oncology uh, uh, involved with, with uh, translation. Uh, and then GCON is an interesting example to highlight because it is one of those uh, rare non-therapeutics investments that we've made. GCON has pioneered and, and is really the leader in, in, in systems that allow uh, a portable uh, modular continuous manufacturing, which is a, a novel manufacturing technique that, that's being, that, that, that really has been developed at Pfizer in part uh, with other industry participants that, that makes manufacturing and setting up new manufacturing sites much more efficient. And, and Pfizer is a, is a customer of, of this company, uh, including for our uh, tremendous expansion that we're undergoing in terms of gene therapy manufacturing. Uh, but not to be forgotten, uh, I mentioned the financial impact. We are looking to make uh, a, a financial return on our investment uh, to at least cover the costs of our group. And I highlight here a number of, of our portfolio companies um, that have uh, gone public uh, last year, uh, raised significant amounts of money and, uh, and, and either have or, or will deliver a financial return to the corporation. I think that concludes my presentation. I'm not sure how I am on time, but uh, I'll, I'll open it up for any questions that may have come in. Okay, thanks, Nicola, for sharing these insights and, and this vision from your from your part. Yes, we have time to make uh, some questions for you, at least one of it from from audience. Um, one of them, um, I guess that the kind of activity you deal with at Pfizer uh, Ventures requires you to take uh, a broader look at global trends in VC funding of healthcare projects. So according to this, the question is, which funding trends do you predict uh, that would define the venture capital landscape in healthcare industry over the next, I don't know, five, 10 years? I'm, I'm sure it's a tricky question, but what's, the, what's your feeling about that? It's it's a it's a great question, and I'm glad that the uh, the time frame specified is five to ten years, uh, actually, and not shorter. That might that might be surprising, but uh, I'm actually a bit worried about the markets in the short term because I think we have uh, we have experienced a period of of of, of uh, strength in the biotech market that's unprecedented, both in its magnitude and length. 
And, uh, it, it, you know, we all know markets are cyclical and it, it, it has to end. But, 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 but that aside, uh, taking a broader view, um, I think we are in an unprecedented time of healthcare innovation uh, if, if, if you zoom out. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, the industry's response to the, to, the, to the coronavirus pandemic, the speed with which, you know, knock on wood, we don't have the data yet, but the speed with which we've moved to, to deliver new therapies and hopefully new vaccines uh, is, is just enormous. But that's just one example. Uh, and if you zoom out over the past 10, 15 years, uh, the pace of healthcare innovation, and I'm specifically speaking now about therapeutics, because that's the area that I'm active in and know, know most about, has just been unprecedented. And I think that is market, markets being cyclical aside, that is something that will stay with us. Science that is advancing at a pace and our ability to diagnose and treat disease and segment disease and better understand disease is, is expanding at, at such a pace that I think the a uh, broader outlook for biotech and, and venture capital is, is as rosy as it has ever been uh, because there's just so much innovation uh, and the quality of the innovation is in, improving uh, that this will be a good, good place for investors to put their money uh, for quite some time to come. And if you're asking me about specific areas uh, that, 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 that we're excited about, you know, I think I spoke about the, the revolution of genetic medicine, which I will call it maybe summarizing the gene therapy and gene editing approaches. I mean, the pace of innovation there and, and the pace of, with which our ability to manipulate genetic material in vitro, in vivo is increasing is just astounding. And it's only a matter of time until that leads to, to true patient breakthroughs. And to some extent, you know, in rare cases, it already has. Um, okay. I think, uh, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Just another, another question for you, Nicola. In, in what stage of the startup do you invest? Do you invest in preclinical stages or even in proof of concept stage? Or on, on what type of yeah. results are you looking for? Yeah, we, we invest. I, I, I want to say we invest at all stages, uh, but I would say most commonly we invest at the what 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 you know commonly would be called the Series A stage. So certainly preclinical, uh, maybe a bit beyond the initial de-risking experiments and 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 where a company is already in place with with a with a with a core management team. So that would be our sweet spot. But we have invested earlier. One of the examples that I showed you, Forks Therapeutics, that was a company build where all there was was an academic founder and some some data generated in the academic founders lab uh, and we certainly have invested later in clinical stage companies like like bold therapeutics that i mentioned but i would say the sweet spot is sort of the preclinical stage where a company already exists and is, is is working on 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 advancing their their science okay nicola thank you so much for joining us today and um, unfortunately we have to move to move forward but uh, thanks my pleasure a lot. thanks a lot thanks and let, us be, let us be in touch thank, thank you, you.